you think that um, empathy modules are indispensable for machines and robots of the future? Why? Because we're going to have robots in our lives. And uh, they're going to work with us. They're going to take care of us. So for us to be able to trust them, we need to build a relationship with the robot. And studies have shown that uh, for us to um, work with robots, we do need robots to understand our intention and emotion, and not just what we say. It's not just a command and control kind of machine. But, but aren't the current robots good enough in that respect? No, because they take your commands literally right now, and uh, they don't understand what you really mean. You can say the same thing and in different tones and with different gesture, it will mean something totally different. So suppose you have a robot that's taking care of the elderly, and uh, the robot says, how are you doing today? And you say, hmm, you know, I'm not sure. And the robot will say, if, if the robot understands you literally, it just means you are not sure. And the robot will just take off and walk away. But what it really means, what the ring ten really is, that the patient or the elderly person is not feeling that great. So the robot has to deduce that intention and the emotion from what you are saying, how you are saying it, and in order to be better, take, uh, in order to take care of us better. And the current robots aren't. No, they are not able to do that yet. We're working on making them to do that. Um, what made you actually want to introduce empathy um, in robots? Because I believe that uh, in the future we're going to need robots to take care of people, to take care of the young, to educate us, to help us with a lot of work. And uh, since we're going to have them around us, um, I think it is important that they, they, they're more human-like in their uh, empathy. Um, wh why are, uh, are empathy modules indispensable for, current, for, let's say, tomorrow's robots? We want robots to be intelligent, right? And uh, uh, intelligent robots need to have both um, the uh, cognitive intelligence and also emotional intelligence. That's what, we're, what we humans have. And when we communicate with each other, we use our emotional intelligence all the time. And uh, that is indispensable for understanding each other. And for robots to understand us, they need to have that kind of emotional intelligence, which is empathy. Because current robots aren't capable of doing that? No, not yet. Not yet. Current robots, um, most of the time, is still controlled by explicit commands. For example, you can tell the robot to uh, vacuum your room. Uh, in some restaurants, there are some robot waiters that will bring you food. And they are focused very narrowly on one task. And they are not that much more advanced than your vacuum cleaner now or the rice cooker. So um, current robots don't have that kind of emotional intelligence. But there are some robots. We're putting this in some robots, and we start to see them. But why would we need intelligent emotions, uh, or emotional intelligence for machines? Because so that they can work with us better, they can help us better. If they need to take care of us, take care of our children, our elderly, they really need to understand our true intent and emotion in order to take care of us. Say if you go to a hospital, there's a nurse, and uh, what a nurse does is not just to take your temperature and look at your vital signs, but also talk to you and see how you're doing and whether you need uh, comforting, whether you need water, whether you need medicine at this point in time. So that requires emotional intelligence and that requires empathy. Is it because they are coming closer to us or because they are in a different uh, environment? Or? Um, yes, the robots are coming more into our lives, into our daily lives, and there will be more, more robots around us. And if they don't have the emotional intelligence, they're more likely to make mistakes and even hurt us. There are a lot of different kinds of emotions. What kind of emotions should it express or should it at uh, least yes. recognize? So, for example, the very first thing we're working on to, for robots to recognize includes whether the human is happy, angry, um, sad, or frustrated, or hesitating, or even um, sense of humor. One of my students is working on uh, recognizing sense of humor. Um, let's talk about the, the range of emotions, because there, of course there are a lot of different yes, kinds of emotions. Yes, yes. Uh, what is, let's say, the primary emotion that they should recognize? The primary emotions are happiness, a sad, sadness, and anger, uh, and neutral.
So you have to be able to tell whether the person is uh, happy. Happy means satisfied, not satisfied, not happy. Um, sad, um, needs help, maybe frustrated, um, angry. So if the person is angry at the robot, the robot should have to do something in response. But people can be ironic or right. sarcastic or what's Right. Wrong? We're also working on uh, for robots to understand, a sen uh, to understand our sense of humor and sarcasm. We're working on that because we use humor and sarcasm uh, in our daily communications to you know, deflect a situation, a challenge, or to make a conversation more friendly, to um, um, make things uh, go more smoothly. So robots also need to learn to recognize that. But even for people, it's sometimes difficult to recognize that. Indeed, they indeed. Learn a robot to recognize that. Indeed. So we're teaching robots to uh, watch a lot of um, comedy shows to learn sense of humor. Um, you know, so it's machine learning. So uh, we think that if we, teach, uh, we, we let the robot watch a lot of comedy shows and observe how people communicate with each other, this is the so-called big data analytics, and we use machine learning, then they will be able to learn. So you let them, you teach them actually by letting them We feed uh, comedy movies. shows and movies and, yes, and, uh, and people's op, you know, daily communications. There are a lot of YouTube videos you know, we feed this to the robot. Um, should it also express somehow? Yes, that's very, it is important. Studies have shown that p humans feel more related to a machine that has some facial expressions, right? So that's why, you know, we don't really feel um, a connection to our refrigerator or to our rice cooker because they're just machines. But when you see a robot with a cute face and people start going, um, they start talking to the robot in a more human way. They go, oh, so how are you doing? And stuff like that. So indeed, the embodiment of a machine in the robotic body with facial expressions is important. And that is uh, also an important area, and different researchers are working on that to uh, allow robot to generate few, uh, appropriate facial expressions, appropriate gesture, for example, to say hi or to shake your hand and all that. Because the tone of voice, the tone of voice robot, also from the robot is very important too. Um, some of you say a robot should not alone learn to understand the content to speak, but it should also compare it with the way it is delivered. Uh, can, can you explain that? So if I say um, something like, I'm really happy I'm going to work today, right? That is, you probably think I'm truly happy that I'm going to work today. But if I say, I am really happy I'm going to work today. Even though the words I speak are the same, but the emotion is totally different. In the second case, you know I'm being sarcastic and I'm not really feeling like going to work. So that tone of voice is important. And we use tone of voice uh, in our way of expressing our meaning a lot. But how do you teach a robot? The so again, the difference is we teach the robot to listen, again, to different kind of uh, tone of voice. Uh, so we show robot examples of uh, um, the same sentences in angry voice, happy voice, and uh, nervous voice, and frustrated voice. And we tell the robot, look, this is the kind of voice that expresses um, uh, anger. This is the kind of voice that expresses frustration. And the robot learns. But somehow we learned that as children. Yes, we did. We and do how learn how as children. So uh, children, robot... So children have multiple like a sensory input, right? Children perceive the world not just by what people are saying, how they are saying, but they also look at things. So right now we're working towards um, enabling robot to have multiple sensory input as well. So the robot now learns from the the speech you you're saying, this the what you're saying, but also learns from how you're saying it. We also uh, enable the robot to look at your facial expression when you say it. So that will enable the robot, robot to learn better. As a child, you learn by experience. Yes, um, indeed. A robot learns by experience. Yes, As that's... a child, you can be traumatized by experience. Right. Well, what about robots? Okay, is it possible somehow to get robot trauma? Or? Yes, I think um, um, robot trauma, I would say, is robot can be misled. 
Okay, if you, you feed robots some information, it's like how we teach our children. Robots can be traumatized too because they're machines. So machine can have machine errors, either from the uh, embedded coding, the program that we wrote, or from the experience, meaning the data they learn from. It's, it's a different kind of trauma than the they than they will trauma. they 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 can be led astray, and then they can um, have errors. Um, is it different from human trauma? They uh, it's different. It's machine trauma, I would say. Yeah, but but. Um, I mean, children can be dysfunctional because of their trauma or can't behave very well. I mean, what about robots teaching? So robots can be dysfunctional. They can stop functioning properly if they uh, have had a machine error. And uh, if the error is caused by uh, their experience, then you can call that trauma. And they can be traumatized into this misbehaving, indeed. Yeah. And so suppose it, uh, it's going to be grumpy. Uh, grumpiness means they, they work slowly or they don't respond friendly in a friendly manner and then they may not even answer, answer you. You can perceive that as grumpiness. The machines can be grumpy, yes. And uh, you also think that robots should apologize somehow? Of course. What, what, uh, what do you mean by robots should be apologized? So robots make errors like humans do. And uh, these days, machines, when there's a machine error, you might see a blue screen and it just says machine error 404. And that is not very friendly. We cannot have robots do that because um, machines are bound to make errors. There's not going to be a perfect machine that never makes errors, just like humans. There's no perfect human who never makes any mistakes. And it is important for empathetic machine to apologize like humans do because that will keep the communication smooth. That will keep the conversation uh, continue with the human user. Because that's actually the most important thing, to keep a smooth kind of... Operation. Indeed, yes. It is most important to keep the conversation smooth and the uh, human-robot communication smooth. But somehow you say, suggest that um, you should be feeling happy with your robot. Is that correct? Am I correct? Yeah. I think humans should feel happy when they are communicating with the robot. At least they can feel uh, related to the robot, friendly, in a friendly sort of way. It is important for humans to feel that in order, in order for us to trust the robot, to work with the robot. We develop a character if we are born. We have a sort of character already genetically, uh, um, but we develop a character because of well, the experience we have. But can a robot develop a character as well, in your opinion, in your model? So when we build um, empathetic robots, we're very careful in also designing the robot personality. This is what we call uh, robot personality. So and at the beginning, we will be designing the personality. So this is a similar to human predisposed you know, personality we're born with. But uh, as we go on, we also let the robot learn personality from data, so from particular personality type. For example, a robot can imitate a particular person's personality type over time by observing how that person communicates with other people. So a robot can also be nurtured into developing its personality. So you have a discussion in, in humans, for example, whether it's nature or whether intelligence yes. is nurtured. Mm -hmm. What about robots? Robot also. There's a nature and nurture. So nature, uh, robot nature comes from our laboratories, right? Comes from the design of a uh, robot by um, humans, by engineers. That's the nature. That's where robot comes out of the lab and, and that robot has that personality. But then as we, since robots have machine learning algorithms in them, they will also learn from you know, particular kind of, uh, you know, they will learn from the environment and then they will continue to develop their personality. For example, if at the beginning we ensure that the robot is not racist, and then that is a predisposed, you know, what we designed at the beginning. And over time, when the robot sees um, whatever is out in the world, there can be racist comments and all that, but the robot will reject that and it will not absorb that into the robot's personality. The robot will make a judgment to say that, oh, that is racist, and I should not learn that. But that suggests that you put moral codes into a robot. At the beginning, yeah, at the beginning, we need to teach robot values uh, and uh, personality. Yeah. Doesn't it depend on what kind of culture you sit in? What kind of 
Yes. So, so, so yeah. So the the people who work on robots, we all have this responsibility. We're like parents to robots. You know, parents to our children. We indeed at the beginning we do teach our robots in certain ways with certain code, and then we let them learn. Very much like how we how we uh, nurture our children. When they reach adulthood, we just let them go. In fact, when they are younger, we send them to school. So we don't always teach them everything ourselves. We send them to school, we send them out in the world, they learn from the environment. So that's what we do with robots. Could a robot, you, you talk a little bit as if it's becoming a person, somehow. Yeah, robot is... So we're building robots to be a little bit more like us, more like a person indeed. Because humans can communicate with that another human being better. Uh, we cannot ask humans to speak the robot language, right? So we need the robot to speak our language and understand us. So, and with that, the personality thing, the uh, robot values, you know, that is all necessary in order for us to communicate with the robot better. Would a robot have a sort of self-image in, in, in terms of uh, I can think about myself? Would the robot think about itself as well? The robot can certainly be uh, taught to think about itself, yes, or has shows the behavior of thinking about itself, meaning that uh, robot can simulate the behavior of somebody who, th who is thinking about itself. Uh, whether there's consciousness within the robot, we don't know, because we don't understand consciousness. Yeah, but everything, that's what everybody's saying. Yeah, you can program it, but it's always pre-programmed. Yeah. It's not always pre-programmed. There are certain things... So this is what I was trying to say. We pre-program a machine learning way. So we pre-program robots to learn, right? Just like humans are also pre-programmed to learn. So part of it is pre-programmed. This is the, what, um, what we call nature. And then that pre-programming also allows the robot to learn, to pick up from the physical world, from interacting with human beings, further um, knowledge and further uh, personality even. And how can we monitor them, then, finally? Can we monitor them? Yeah. Um, uh, oh, I mean, we monitor people. We tell people not to behave like that, that they're oh, getting indeed, 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 indeed. Whatsoever, there, there's a sort of punishment on bad behavior, for example. So uh, different robots, different, depending on the purposes. So if they are supposed to take care of patients and they make mistakes, then we think there's going to be, uh, there must be a, a machine error. Then we would check the machine, we would check the code, and try to spot that error. Um, we don't really uh, punish robot per se at this point, but it can be imagined that in some learning algorithms, we can incorporate what is a reward and what is punishment so that they learn proper things. Yeah, but for example, there's a discussion now about autonomous cars, for example. Yes, yes. Who is responsible mm -hmm. um, when robots come closer? You'll mm. get the same kind of question, but these are deeper because they can harm us somehow. Indeed, indeed. If they accidentally harm somebody, you, you said, you know, robot, you shouldn't do that. And they should learn from that. Um, punishment, perhaps not like human punishment. I don't think, you know, we can hit the robot and the robot will feel, oh, you know, it's not, not that kind of punishment. But it's in the algorithm that there's a cost function whether um, it's doing the right thing or not. There will be a cost function of positive and negative values. Well, what's your wildest dreams in terms of robots? My wildest dreams is to have uh, my uh, memory, my sensor, sensory uh, abilities, my intelligence, my emotional intelligence, whatever it is, all be um, downloaded to a robot of, uh, with an Android body and then that robot will continue functioning as me when I'm no longer in this world. You want to make a copy of yourself? Then? I want to make a copy of myself. That would be interesting. And you think that's feasible? I think uh, to some extent we're already doing that. But uh, given, uh, I'm not sure it's feasible within my lifetime, but I think it is feasible. Um, the robot will have, um, you know, will be equipped with our perception abilities and our intelligence, our emotional intelligence, and our ability to learn. And uh, the robot, you know, there are people who are building robots with uh, really human-like form, 
with you know, um, very uh, lifelike skin and eyes and all that. And we put this together, um, the robot will, have the will be embodied in the almost human-like body. So they will pick up signals from the world as we do. So that is, I think that is feasible. And I'm not saying that that will be me, that will be just a copy of me. And that will not necessarily have the conscience of me. I'm not talking about me living uh, forever. I'm talking about a copy. But what would it be? What would it be? Very good question. A copy. It's uh, just an enjoy. Uh, it's a copy of, uh, of a human. But what would a copy mean? A copy of you mean? What would it do? So it would do what I would do under given circumstances. For example, maybe it can go on lecture in the university, teach students. It can learn, uh, like I do, from, uh, from the world. And maybe it can perform research. It can build other robots. Yeah, but it won't be you. It will not be me. It will be a copy of me. Um, but suppose it would be a copy of you, would it develop its own consciousness? What would it, what would, uh, it's, it's quite hard to imagine. But I know, I know. Um, we don't know what consciousness is, right? It's, uh, it's almost a philosophical question. Is consci consciousness, does it exist? Once we have all this kind of sensory input, intelligence and learning in place, would there be a point where and there is indeed a consciousness. I don't know. I don't know. We don't know what consciousness is and where it comes from. But in terms of the old philosophers, let's say you could say that the robot finally concludes, I think so I am. Yes, indeed. I think so I am. Indeed, indeed. A robot can conclude that. Um, but even then, the robot can have the behavior of someone with consciousness. And we still don't know whether that robot really has this meanness, you know, this self-consciousness. And if you look, let's say, in 25 years, what would do? Look at that? If you look in 25 years, what would robots like, look like in your perception? So in 25 years, I believe there will be robots, um, not all robots, some robots will look just like us. They will talk just like us and behave just like us. It's possible in 25 years. Um, they can move and gesture exactly like humans. And then... Um, some of these robots, these are called androids, will be very, very, um, you cannot tell the difference between them and humans. And then there are other robots. We still need other robots to help us, other robotic machines like the vacuum cleaner. The vacuum cleaner is not going to have a human head. That would be kind of creepy. So we still have other robots that don't look like humans. So there will be a variety of robots around, uh, among us. You are working to make that into a reality. Um, when, you, when you expose this scientific work of you, what's the response of people? Um, they, some people um, feel threatened. They, some people question why robots need to be more human-like. Um, they think that then they will be challenging us or taking over us. Others, like especially children, think it's just really cool. They, want to, they cannot wait for that to happen. Um, so I think depending on the culture people come from and what they expect of machines, um, they have different reactions. But for the most part, for example, I talk to doctors, medical doctors, and they love the idea that robots will have empathy um, to, to, towards patients so they can better take care of patients. Can you imagine that people somehow become scared or afraid? Some people are already scared. Some people are already scared of robots. Um, I think when people see robots become more human-like, they imagine all sorts of things. And I think one reason is there has been too many science fiction movies that portray robots as threatening and uh, you know, menacing. But that's just science fiction. And uh, people, shouldn't be, people should not be um, uh, swayed by, by fiction. You know, we're looking at the reality, we're all build, building robots to help people. Um, nobody is building robots to, um, you know, purposely uh, destroy humankind and that kind of thing. Because that's actually part of your work, to let robots be compelling uh, and empathic. In, we, we're trying to build robots that will be friendly. Indeed, to have, if robots have empathy, then they will never harm people, right? So that's, that's why empathy is important. Yeah. And if they do have empathy, they will never hurt us. There are some robots laws made by Isaac Asimov. Yes, somehow. the three robots. 
The three laws of robotics. Um, I don't remember all of them. No, but 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 actually, one of them is to help people. Yeah, that's, to help that's, people that's and not to harm. Purpose, yeah, purpose. indeed, indeed. So one of the uh, three laws of robotics is to for robots to help people, and I think all the robotics working on robots today are trying to do that. Could you imagine that people start to see robots if they are so friendly as a friend, or really as a friend? I hope so. I hope people will see robots as friends because they're friendly. If we can see robots as friends, then we can um, trust them to help us. Okay. Um, and the friends forever? I mean, the companion somehow? The... Um, we hope robots, we're building robots to be people's companion, to be companions to children, to be companion to, to um, um, the elderly when they're lonely and all that. But like all machines, the hardware uh, deteriorates, right? So uh, your iPhone or your smartphone, you might buy the next generation smartphone. So robots, are we going to have a robot that lasts forever? Um, I don't think right now that's the purpose. So you might have the next generation of the same robot. Um, but that robot will have the same personality as the first robot and will have the memory. So yeah, in that sense, you can have a robot companion forever. But that body might, might have to be changed from time to time. Yeah, and if you want to have a robot, can it be copied to another robot? Or how should you imagine that? So the intelligence of robot is completely software-based. So we can make multiple copies of the same software. We can have the same robot, same personality, same memory in different robotic bodies. So we can have multiple robots that sound the same, behave the same, and do the same thing. Their and copy, copy the experience because it's software based. Right. Um, but somehow people love their machines, like they love their cars. They start loving their robots as well, probably. I think people will love their robots if the robots are friendly and pathetic, cool, have a sense of humor. Who wouldn't love them? People will love them, like they love their motorcycles and their cars, in, indeed. But they also might want to have multiple robots, you know, a different version with a different personality, just like some people like multiple cars of different styles. Do you think that we are prepared for those kind of robots? So I think people are prepared. We've already seen men on the moon um, 40, 50 years ago, and it's high time we see robots amongst us, and I think people are ready for robots, as long as they're friendly. If we talk about your scientific work, you were actually looking at Language, language mm -hmm. is very important, and mm -hmm. the intention of language. Can mm -hmm. you explain a little bit what you're doing? So what we're doing is, um, when we, for example, use the example of humor. As I explained before, humor comes from not just the words you use, but the tone of voice and even your, 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 your facial expressions. So the same word expressed in different contexts can be humorous and not humorous. So what we do is that we program uh, machines to have uh, learning algorithms. So they learn from watching a lot of uh, comedy shows, for example, and YouTube videos, and figure out what, what humor is. So next time somebody says something humorous, the machine will know and to, to be able to laugh, for example. But how do they know that it's funny? Uh, how do they know it's funny? From learning. From, uh, so in, in the learning algorithms enable the machines to see examples, many, many examples, millions of sentences, mil you know, lots of t uh, thousands and tens of thousands of TV shows where people laugh. Right? So for example, humor consists of, uh, you know, how do you tell a joke? And you, there, there, usually there's a trigger, uh, there's a setup, there's a trigger and the punchline. So uh, machines will, the machine will see that in all these uh, comedy shows, like humans do. And then they will pick up uh, you know, when there will be a punchline, and they know that is humor. And the algorithm, machine algorithm, uh, learning algorithm we use currently is what, what's um, commonly known as deep learning algorithms. So um, how does this robot learn what's humorous? So we use uh, machine learning to teach robots to learn about our emotion sentiments, including humor. And machine learning, there are two kinds of uh, uh, machine learning approaches. One is what we call supervised learning. The other is unsupervised. Supervised learning, we actually give machines examples. And we, have them, uh, we have the data annotated by humans. Humans say, look, this is a sentence that's humorous. This is a sentence that's a punchline for a joke. And this is where people laugh. 
So that's called supervised learning. And machines learn from that um, to have a sense of humor. Unsupervised learning is more like how humans learn. We don't tell the machine explicitly, this is a humor, this is not humorous. And uh, we just give them a lot of data and for the machine to learn from context. So the unsupervised learning is really what we hope to achieve in the future. Because if a machine can have unsupervised learning, then we don't need human explicitly teaching machines all the time. This is humor, this is happiness, and all that. So that will save a lot of effort from, from the uh, human annotators. And unsupervised learning is harder, though because uh, it will require a lot of general learning abilities and general deduction abilities, induction, and I believe it will require uh, machines to have uh, multi-sensory input. But do we know how unsupervised learning is working? Um, so cognitive scientists have been studying how, pe uh, how humans learn. So um, they believe that humans have, of course, we have, we're born with some kind of learning abilities innate. Um, when babies are born, they already know how to. They already know how to recognize their mother's fo uh, faces and voices. Right? They're already picking up from ten months in the mother's tummy. Uh, let, let, let's just take it. Again. Do we know how people learn un unsupervised? We don't know exactly how we learn unsupervised. We're trying to model that. So uh, another side of working on robots is that. When we want to build robots to be more human-like, we have built models of human thinking. So as we research on how to make robots to have a sense of humor, we understand humans' sense of humor better. So as we learn, uh, as the machines learn, we also learn how we function. So we, we don't know exactly how we, um, how, we, how we learn in an unsupervised fashion, but we're trying to, 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 to research on that. That's a, that's a very important research direction. So, I mean, there's a lot of talk about artificial intelligence. What, what, what is, let's say, the condition of having an artificial intelligence system, in your opinion? So, the condition of artificial intelligence, we are trying to work in towards what some people call strong AI, which is a general purpose AI system or general purpose robot. Today, we're only working, we're still only working on. Um, single-purpose or multi-purpose robots that can do one task. You know, you've heard of, um, you know, AlphaGo beating uh, the world champion Go, and there are systems that can, um, you know, lift heavy weights and assemble cars. These are all single-purpose robotic systems. So we're working towards a general-purpose robotic system that can really be your companion and take care of people. In that case, then the robot must have intelligence to be more human-like. And for human intelligence, empathy is indispensable. It must recognize not just you know, um, what people are saying, but how people are saying it, what you truly mean. So empathy is important. Emotional intelligence is a huge part of human intelligence. You suggest that it couldn't be intelligent without empathy. I think it, we cannot call a system or robot human-like intelligence without, without empathy. Is that what is lacking somehow in the discussion? Of our um, it's, uh, it has been lacking in our discussion of uh, building AI systems for the last um, 30 years, but it's coming now. And uh, I'm happy to say that uh, I've been talking about it and other, um, some other researchers are also working on this. That because you're working in this field? Is it yes, I'm working in this field. Uh, that is a new direction, and people in general agree with, with this uh, direction. So, yeah, there are researchers working towards this goal as well. There is agreement in terms of that. But can you imagine people being afraid of, you know, this huge intelligent network that is going to conquer us or something like that? I think people are afraid of the unknown. People are always are afraid of the unknown. I think if, you, if we go back in time uh, in 1950s and describe today's internet and smart, smartphones and how we use them and how we can get access to good material as well as bad material at your fingertip, if we told people in the 50s about this today, they will also be very, very afraid. Uh, what happens is that we adapt to technology just like technology adapt to, adapts to us. So um, it doesn't happen overnight. So we've been living with artificial intelligence for a long time already, starting with all those um, uh, automatic um, you know, calculators. 
And then you know we 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 take an airplane with uh, without you know uh, being afraid that it's being uh, flown by a computer actually. So we've been living with uh, artificial intelligence for a long time. It's just you know gradually we're going to get used to uh, the evolution of such intelligent machines. They will gradually be able to talk to us, and they will gradually be able to f uh, empathize with our feelings, and they will gradually will be able to do more to help us. We'll get used to them step by step. It doesn't happen overnight. But what would be the, yeah, the ultimate condition to generate, let's say, artificial intelligence, uh, um, good robots, etc.? What would, would be the, the, the ultimate condition? I mean, we are developing cognitive systems. That's not yes. Problem. But you talk about robots with a heart. Can you talk a little bit more about the necessity of this heart? Yes. So without um, empathy in the robot, a robot would never behave and learn and, and understand like a human being. So without empathy, I would say that the robot um, would not be human-like, and that intelligence would, would be limited. So you think it is of the utmost important that the, the entire discussion about the artificial intelligence also should include that? The entire discussion about artificial intelligence does include that today, and uh, uh, I'm one of the people who, 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 who champion it, and, uh, and uh, in general, there's a general agreement that it is needed for artificial, intel uh, for artificial intelligence, that people work on different components of artificial intelligence. And uh, uh, those of us who uh, work on the, uh, the emotion recognition certainly see this as our, our job to, to make that happen, to make robots have empathy. If you look at, let's, let's say, further and further into the future. Can you imagine that there is a combination of humans and robots and artificial intelligence that goes beyond, well, the stars, for example, or whatsoever, but that it's larger than we are? This program is called the Mind of the Universe, but its intention is, mm. of course, that we develop some kind of Indeed. a new status. Can you imagine such a thing? Yes. Um, what's interesting today, what's happening already, is that my mind and your mind are no longer limited from, by our own life experience. If you, you know, 20 years ago, I wouldn't know how to respond to a lot of questions, right, and that I'm not an expert in. But today, anybody with access to the internet and Wikipedia can tell you a lot of things about a specific topic. So our human mind and our human knowledge has evolved. We're already connected to this vast um, network of minds. Right, so you can pull up YouTube video to learn how to cook any any kind of food. You can pull up a, a, a Wikipedia page to learn about any particular technical topic or political topic or some history, and that happens instantaneously. So is that part of my mind already, or is part of the world? We already are connected. So in the future, when robots enhance our physical abilities. They will also enhance our mental abilities. When that happens, there will be basically on top of the internet we have access to, we also have these robots that enhance our ability to understand the knowledge. And uh, so that, was, that will be another layer of intelligence that enhances human intelligence. Just like today, some, there's a robotic system that help people who cannot walk, walk, right? Those exoskeleton. Uh, robots that can help people uh, become stronger physically. Uh, robots can also enhance our intelligence to, to enable us to know more, to be able to do more and think better uh, with the help of the robots. Earlier on, I asked you your wildest dream. Can you explain a little bit more, let's say intensely, what your wildest dream is? So to build robots uh, with all the components of human intelligence, human learning abilities, human perception, human memories, and, uh, and the human judgment, human values. So a long list of these things. Uh, my wildest dream will be able to do that and teach that to a robot. And for example, for a robot to copy all that from me and uh, my personal experience, my memory, my judgment, my values, uh, which evolve as well. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's like a copy of a, of a person, of me, and uh, when I'm not around, that copy will continue. Maybe we'll continue to talk to my children, 
talk to my children's children, but they know it's not me. They know it's not mommy, but it's a copy. Um, but that would be interesting uh, to replicate before I die. So I'm, I see whether it's really me or not. But it's a replica? That's actually what you... A replicant? Like, yeah. Yeah, you've seen Blade Runner, right? I'm a huge fan of Blade Runner. Um, yeah, my wildest dream will have replicants. But replicants also know they're replicants. That they don't, they don't fool people into thinking they're human beings. And it wouldn't be you. I, I mean, would it have if 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 a, oh, It doesn't have to be me. It can be anybody. Yeah. yeah. No, but but if if you copy, let's say your yes. your information yes. somehow, uh, um, what would it be? Would it be you? Would it be what do you think? I mean. I don't know. I'm curious to know. I don't know. If that happens, would that be me? Would that be just a copy of me? I can say that today we, we have people who can build a robot that physically looks like me, right? Exactly a copy of me. But intelligence-wise and memory and all that, it's not close. It's, n it's still very, very far from being a complete copy of a, uh, of a, a real human being. So, but if we have a more, you know, almost perfect copy, would that still be just a copy? I think it's just a copy. It's not me. It's not, let's say, the wish for immortality. No, it would right. be my avatar, I would say. That would be my avatar. That would be avatar at the physical and mental level, but still an avatar. Not the real you. Not the real me. Maybe it can do the task that I can do. I don't know. Maybe it can continue to teach. But uh, it would be an avatar. Would it be something like uh, um, a 3D or a 4D photograph of you, um, somehow for your children or your grandchildren? I'm actually thinking it's going to be a physical body with uh, very human-like skin and very human-like everything. Um, there are people um, working on building that. So I think uh, that's entirely possible in 20 years. The body is possible, but the mind you know, because we don't understand the mind completely. So how, you know, component by component, module by module, we're building the, the mind into the robot. And today we're still talking about service robots and home robots that do particular tasks, right? And we're still not building a general purpose human-like robot, like a replicant. We're not doing that yet. And we don't have an interest a specific interest in doing that. It, it would be more like a, a, a scientific pursuit because we don't know what we need. Why do we need a general purpose robot that's exactly like me? What's the fun, you know, application of that? There's no application except that. But that would, be, that would serve as like a scientific quest rather than you know, um, engineering you know, application rather than a commercial purpose, right? It's a scientific quest. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, when we study robot, when we model intelligence for a robot, we are also modeling human intelligence. We're studying humans at the same time. And that is interesting to me. Some people could say, she has been reading too much science fiction. <laughs> yes, <laughs> some people would say that. But you know, many people who work on artificial intelligence are huge science fiction fans. Um, we're just naturally attracted to science fiction since we were young, and then we got into this area because of that. Many of us are, many. To make it into a reality? Yeah, to make it into reality. And uh, I think uh, it's fair to say that a lot of our imagination are shaped by science fiction we grew up with. And uh, so you will see things that look science fiction-like. And it's not a coincidence. It's just we're, we're shaped by that.